Art of Adventure. This is episode 223 with the Indiana Jones of Investing, Jim Rogers. The Art of Adventure is the podcast that helps you travel the world, run your business, and embark on an epic quest. I'm your host, lead explorer and guide, Derek Laddermilk. You can find the show notes for this episode and all the previous episodes and future episodes for those of you living in the future. Actually, all of you listening to this are in the future. Uh, at DerekLoudermilk.com. And don't forget to check out the book Superconductors, which I am the author, which is coming out July 3rd. And that has featured lots of interviews from guests on this podcast and all the research I've been doing about businesses around the world and digital nomads and the future of work over the last several years. So there's so much in there. Uh, I'm I'm really excited that this book is coming out because it's just a it's a ton of really cool lessons and skills that you can learn and insights from all kinds of insightful people like the guests on this show. So uh, superconductors, order your copy. All right. So today's episode with Jim Rogers, very exciting. So that that phrase about him, the Indiana Jones of investing, is because someone called him that because of his two great adventures that he's taken around the world. The first one is detailed in his book, Investment Biker, where he took a motorcycle around 55 different countries and invested along the way. That was in 1990, and he did it again 10 years later, over three years, where he drove through over 100 countries, setting another world record for driving around the world, investing along the way. So he is known as a brilliant investor. He is worth somewhere between several hundred million and a billion dollars. And I was, I didn't really know that he was so well, highly regarded when I reached out to him to have him on the show, but he gladly agreed to come on. So I'm super grateful and really amazed that he is willing to spend an hour with us. So I get to pick his brain uh, about adventure, you know, about driving through war zones and about border crossings and how to bribe people and how to see whether a country is worth investing in by driving through it. Who do you talk to? How do you get to talk to them? What kinds of things are you looking for? So we're really digging into not just how to invest, but how to observe the world through the lens of a brilliant investor. So very cool to learn to be able to think like Jim Rogers. And I also ask him about what it's like moving his family from New York to Singapore. He weighs in on cryptocurrencies. And you'll hear why he thinks we should eliminate passports and visas. So this is such a wide-ranging, fascinating interview with a really incredible figure, Jim Rogers. So without further ado, here is the adventure capitalist. Yeah, Roger. Jim, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm delighted, Derek. And I believe you're currently in Singapore, which is the same time zone. I'm in Bali, so you actually may hear some rice field noises or jungle noises in the background. <laughs> Well, it's Bali. It's ten nineteen in Singapore. What time is it in, Do- in Bali? It's also ten nineteen in the morning. So oh, okay. we're at the same. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I, I frequently come to Singapore to do visa runs. You have to leave Indonesia and re-enter the country. What's your impression of living in Singapore now? You've been there for uh, t- ten years or more after leaving New York. We came here for good in two thousand seven. Uh, so far, so good. We're very pleased. Oh, we would have left, obviously. Now everything works in Singapore. Good education, good health care. We're, we're pleased to be here. Is it what you expected it would be like? Uh, I'm not sure what I expected looking back on it. Who knows? I don't remember. Uh, well, I expected everything to work. Uh, I expected the schools to be good. They have been. Uh, haven't needed much health care, so that hasn't been a problem. But no, it's a, so far, actually, it's been uh, much more, we've been much busier uh, on a social scene than I would have expected. 
no, everything, everything has been fine. And my understanding is that, you know, I think I heard you say a smart person in 1907 would have moved to New York. So now that in 2007, you're moving to Singapore because that's, you know, Asia is where things are happening. What sort of opportunities have you been able to access because of that move that you you wouldn't have otherwise? Well, my main reason for moving here was so that my children would speak Mandarin. Uh, I was doing that in New York, but it became clear that it would not really work unless I moved to a place where they had to speak Mandarin. I heard too many stories about kids who would just stop speaking whatever language it was, whether it was Spanish or Chinese or whatever, because it wasn't cool. So I realized I had to move to a Chinese-speaking city, and that has been perfect. My children, to my surprise and delight, win the Mandarin-speaking contest in Singapore. So it is... It has been, you know, Derek, if I went to a movie where blue-eyed kids were the best Mandarin speakers in a Chinese country, I would walk out. But <laughs> so, so it is working, and that was my main goal for coming here. Great. Okay. And do you run your life and businesses and investing any differently because of your location? No, not, not, you know, these days you can, you can invest no matter where you are. Uh, you can invest in the, in darkest Asia, darkest South America, darkest anywhere. It's uh, pretty easy to access a computer and you can do anything you want. And that's mainly what I do. Uh, I'm on some boards. It's a little more travel time to the U.S., but it's less travel time to Moscow or other places where I'm a board member. So... So no, I don't do much different. Okay, well, wow, that's uh, that's kind of nice. <laughs> one of the one of the main reasons why I wanted to speak to you was because of your your big adventure trips that you took driving around the world. My my housemate is is an investor, and he he recommended your books, and I had a chance to to dive into some of those trips and. I, I understand that you were an investor before the trips. Um, so the, the motorcycling around the world was first, and then the, for the listener, the driving around the world 10 years later. Did or how, how did those adventure trips change you as an investor? Well, uh, I really I was an investor before I started becoming an adventurer. I wanted to be an adventurer before, but I didn't have the money. Eric, it's not, I mean, you can do, you can have adventures with no money, but it's a lot simpler if you have a little bit of money at least. So I saved up some money and had always wanted to go around the world on a motorcycle, which actually was almost impossible in, in the early days because of Soviet Union, Red China, things like that. It was it really wasn't possible to do it right anyway could do it, but it wasn't the real thing as far as I was concerned. So finally, after I'd saved some money, I got permission to drive across China and Soviet Union, and, and off I went to, to see the world. Uh, I'm not sure that that has changed my investing too much. Well, I've invested in some countries I wouldn't have otherwise, because, you know, when you see the ground of the world from the ground up, you see what's really going on, and you probably can find opportunities that you wouldn't find reading the newspaper or or whatever. So I did find some opportunities. Some of them I basically knew about. I knew China was a, was a great place to do things before I, I set off around the world. I first went to China in 1984. I, I was terrified because I'd been reading American propaganda all my life about the evil, bloodthirsty, vicious Chinese. So I was terrified didn't take me long to figure out the Chinese were not evil, bloodthirsty, terrifying people, that they were hardworking, educated, ambitious, they saved their money, etc. Disciplined. Uh, so that I, I learned firsthand by driving, by driving around China. Uh, I came to see, it uh, didn't take me long to figure out that China was on the rise again and that China would be the next great country in the world. 
I went back to New York and I would broadcast a write or lecture about you know the coming age of China and of course everybody in those days uh, poo-pooed it they were hilarious in fact they all said if they said anything they said Japan 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 uh, and I said no 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 China 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 uh, and that has of course turned out to be correct I could see that because you know you see the world close to the ground and you see what's really going on and I began uh, making investments in China and have been made investments in China ever since. Okay. I have investments in Japan, by the way, but they are only recent. They've only been in the past few years. I did not invest in Japan back in those days. Interesting. And when you say investing in China, investing in Japan, you mean a specific industry or a specific company that you like? Or, or what well, exactly do you mean? I invest in, in markets, uh, stocks, or bonds, currencies, commodities, whatever, both long and short. So when I say invested, I meant investing in markets, primarily stock markets or currency markets. Okay. And when, maybe you could talk a little bit more, when you're driving through China uh, and you're seeing what's happening on the ground, how... You know, how does a conversation with the local or how does driving into a new city, how does that inform a decision to invest or not? Well, if you <laughs> see the world from the ground up, you have to know what's going on. Uh, when you cross a border, wherever the border is, you learn very quickly whether, <laughs> whether things are efficient whether there's honest, whether people are honest, you learn about the black market. If there is one, you learn these things very, very quickly, and that starts to shape. It starts to shape my view, anyway. Uh, as you drive across a country, you see whether there are roads, whether there are shops, hotels, restaurants, all kinds of things that you and I usually take for granted, but they don't exist everywhere. But you start to find out pretty quickly how developed a country is and how much potential it has. And as you go further, uh, I try anyway to notice other things to see if there are opportunities which I haven't found otherwise. For the listener, who a lot of a lot of listeners to the show do quite a bit of travel, and myself included, we generally move from country to country, spend three months living somewhere. What what can I be noticing? Or, or looking for, uh, you know, in addition to these infrastructures, or how, how would I know an opportunity to invest in a country um, if I spend some time there? Well, you, you can, there are all sorts of things, depending on what you're doing. If nothing else, you might see a, a chain of restaurants, chain that's new and developing, that's got good food or good whatever. Likewise, shops, hotels, uh, you know, one of my early trips, I bought 7-Eleven probably 28 years ago because I could see what was happening to 7-Eleven around the world. Uh, you can see when I crossed into Botswana back in 1990 or whatever it was, uh, I could see I had just come down through the center of Africa from, from Europe, and I said, uh, oh, my gosh, what is this country? You know, everything worked after having been where nothing worked. By the time I got to the capital, uh, I realized I wanted to invest in the country because it was efficient, modern, developing. So I went to find a stock exchange, and there was a stock exchange, very small. But I, I bought every share, uh, I mean, shares in every company on the exchange. Mm -hmm. Now, Derek, lest you think I'm some kind of big hitter or something, only seven companies listed on the stock exchange <laughs> at the time. But I could see the potential. So it, it depends uh, if you're in a, in a country where there's a new industry. Well, China, I told you, I'd been terrified of red China all my life. But I came to see that that was false propaganda, like most propaganda is false propaganda, no matter which government. And I came to realize that I should be investing in the Chinese stock market. So there are various and sundry ways and things to see as you go around. And it partially depends on what you know. If you know a lot about fashion, you might see something in fashion that I would not see. 
because I know nothing and care nothing about fashion or cars or housing or who knows what it is. Well, gotcha. you might have a head of, of some knowledge that I don't have. Is there any rule of thumb for how do you know when you know enough about something to invest in it? You never know enough, even after you invest and you think you know. You, you will find you make mistakes and there are new things to happen. One thing about the world, it's always changing. You know, no matter what you think is sound and true, it might be today, maybe even tomorrow. But the world is changing and always changing fairly dramatically and fairly fast. So you have to stay on top of it. You have to constantly work over, check whatever you think is right. And so you had 10 years between your two trips and spending, you know, seeing the world from the ground up. What sort of changes were the most dramatic that you observed in between those two trips? One, the Berlin Wall fell uh, between my trips. And so there was a fairly dramatic change. You know, by the time my second trip, nobody wanted to be a communist anymore. Nobody even wanted to be a socialist anymore. If they did want to be a socialist, they wanted to be a rich socialist. Communism had completely failed, and everybody understood that. And so it was pretty dramatic that I could do things that I would not have been able to do uh, before or not very easily. And credit cards. First time I went, money was a very difficult thing because you, you had to transport it across borders if you had it. When you got to a new country, how do you get money? Uh, you know, yes, you could go to a bank and perhaps have money wired to you. Uh, but the second trip, most places took credit cards. First time, credit cards were pretty much unknown in much of the world. The second time, credit cards were accepted nearly everywhere. And that was a gigantic relief and made life much easier than the first time. You know, capitalism had won. And so everybody was... They were spreading capitalism as fast as they could. When you when you arrive at a at a border, I remember reading about the code word Coca Cola for maybe that was in Russia where you would slip them money. So is bribing or or giving gifts or smoothing the way is that a skill that is applicable in other areas of your life? Well, I rarely uh, gave bribes. I didn't like giving bribes would use it resisted, but what we did would do uh, when we got to a border, we would always have a carton of cigarettes on top. You know, if, if there was a suitcase that we thought would be open or a saddlebag that we thought would be open, we had a carton of cigarettes right at the top. So the first thing they would see would be a carton of Western cigarettes and a small bottle of whiskey, you know, half pint or whatever. Uh, and nearly always... You know, they, they would say something, oh, what is this? And we would say, well, we don't smoke anymore. Would you like these? Or we don't drink anymore. Would you like this? And needless to say, invariably, yes. Even in Muslim countries, they would take the whiskey because for some reason they all knew this was our value. And is that a bribe? Is that a gift? Whatever that is, it was something we learned quickly. Mm -hmm. You also learn that if you're traveling... For many reasons, you need to take small bills, um, and in, in particularly small U.S. $1 bills, for instance, but some currency would be easily recognized because if you're somewhere where you want to give a gift and all you have $100 bills, I assure you, he cannot make change, and he doesn't want to make change. I noticed that you ended up meeting a lot of high-level officials or relatively important people in these countries. How, how did you end up meeting, you know, probably more influential people than the average citizen as you traveled? Well, usually it's not my, my style because I know what they're going to say. I mean, if I go to see a government in any country in the world, I know what he's going to say. I can say it better than she can because I've been to so many countries. But at times, if I wanted to invest in a country, then I would make it a point to try to find the appropriate official and or tax him or her, go see her, do whatever is necessary. 
that didn't always work, but as I said, didn't even always want to. Because usually it's a waste of time to go see them, and because I know what they're going to say, or they're going to give you inaccurate information or false information. I remember once I was in, uh, where were we? It was in Gabon, in West Africa, and I wanted to find out about the roads going down into Congo and other countries, because there were several wars going on. So I my go to the Minister of Finance, a Minister of Transport, ask about the roads, said the roads would be good, don't worry, no problem with the roads, and I asked about crossing the border because of the war. He said, absolutely no problem, you, you, you'll be able to cross the border easily. So needless to say, when we got down within 40 kilometers of the border, we found out that the, the border was closed, had been closed for a long time, and nobody could get across the border. This is coming from the Minister of, of Transport, so he would think he would know what he's talking about. Frequently have no clue. <laughs> I remember once we were oh, in Angola. We were going to Angola, and again, there was civil war and war, and it was very complicated. So we went to see the ambassador uh, and asked what we would do and if we got into Angola, how we were going to get out. And he explained to us, oh, well, if you go, it's a separate, as a part of Angola, which is separate separated from the country called the Cabinda. And so he said, well, there's a ferry from Cabinda down to the main part of the country, and it's a wonderful ferry, blah, blah, blah. My wife asked him, he said, oh, yeah, I took the ferry last year, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. Uh, needless to say, when we got to Cabinda, there was no ferry. No, the ferry had not run for, for years, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is the ambassador. <laughs> so... I don't know if these guys just are paid to, I, I know they're paid to lie all over the world because they're supposed to say good things about their country, uh, but sometimes you just get really hopeless and useless information. Wow. When you're thinking about going into a war zone or, or driving through a war zone, what is what is the feeling that that you have? I mean, do you, do you feel in, in danger? Of course. I mean, war zones by definition are places where a lot of people are getting killed, uh, rightly or wrongly. Uh, so no, and we tried to avoid war zones. Don't get me wrong. Don't think I'm sitting here <laughs> planning new trips to go to war zones. No, we always tried to avoid war zones, but but sometimes we couldn't. So uh, no, you you take a calculated risk. You try to figure out everything you can, make it alive, uh, and. So far, I mean, I'm alive, as you can see. I still have my arms and legs, so I did it and was successful. But you're always worried, and you you have your cigarettes, you have your alcohol, you have your dollar bills, you have whatever you might need uh, to to give to somebody as a gift. But and off you go. Wow. And as you know, uh, both you and I are American, and I think you can't help but gain perspective on your home country as you leave. What what sort of insights about America do you think were made possible for you by your adventures? Well, it's clear that uh, nearly everywhere people like Americans. They like the people. They want to talk to the people. They want to go visit the people. You know, they're very, very keen on American citizens, American residents. But they're also almost equally as disapproving of the U.S. government. I'm not quite sure what happens to American citizens when they go to Washington, but something clearly does because they become a different, a different kind of animal when they work for the U.S. government. Uh, so it was frequent that we would run into people who were very, very keen and excited to see us as Americans, but we often always, not always, but nearly always ran into lots of criticism of the U.S. government, and frequently it was justified. Mm -hmm. How do you learn about the world now? I don't think you've been on a road trip around the world recently. Um, so, so how are you getting your information these days? Well, now, of course, the Internet is a source of a lot of information. And one of the things that I have learned all my life, I uh, try to teach my children, you know, try to get three or four sources of information, whatever it is you're looking up. I used to read newspapers from different 
countries at different sources so that I could find out about country X. You know, you, you get a different story from everybody, but then you have to put it in your brain and sift it around and hope you get it by then. So, uh, the BBC was very useful. BBC World Service on my travels probably saved my life a few times. Now there's the internet. The internet covers just about everything, and there is internet one way or the other nearly everywhere in the world. So I would say today the internet and the BBC be my best sources of information. Gotcha. And what when you're not traveling or going to a, a board that you sit on, what does your normal day look like in Singapore? Well, I get up at six every morning to take my children to school. I always take my children to school if I'm in town and I collect my, then I go to the gym. Uh, I work out. I would be in the gym right now if I weren't speaking to you. I collect my children from school. I, I work on the, on the internet, uh, whether it's email or news or whatever. To, and maybe I'll make some investments, maybe not. Probably not because I, I don't, I'm not terribly active in the markets. I'm more of an investor who buys and just sits at night. I always put my kids to bed if I'm here, unless I'm out somewhere. And, you know, when I'm in town, my main interest is my kids. I was very much against children for decades, for nearly all of my life. I thought kids were a horrible waste of time, energy, money. I felt so sorry for people who had children. I was never, ever, ever going to do something so foolish as to have children. Well, I was wrong. I was 100% wrong about kids. Uh, so now that I finally have a couple of kids, I try to spend as much time with them as I can. Great. Yeah, I am a relatively new father myself. And one of the things we had to decide was to continue traveling, continue being partially nomadic. So so far, we've, we've chosen to, but we've spent time in, in Europe and Bali and Mexico, places that are relatively easy to, to live still. Well, I, just a comment on that. I used to say to my wife as we were traveling, and I said, we could have a kid while we travel. And she said, oh, you got to be kidding. That would be crazy. And I would remind her, you know, 200 years ago in America, I could use that as, as an example. People would get in covered wagons and head west yeah absolutely babies can live anywhere a kid can be raised just about anywhere now the effects i don't know maybe it's better maybe it's worse certainly america became a very successful country partly based on all those kids who were born heading across the, the wilderness in a wagon mm -hmm. yeah that's it's it brings us to uh, demographics, and I know that a lot of countries, European countries and Japan in, in particular, are seeing a lot of their workforce retire. What, how, how does demographics play into how you look at a country and opportunities to invest? Well, you have to understand the demographics. It may or may not be a crucial factor or not. For instance, uh, Japan, for the first time in recorded history, uh, has a demographic disaster. They have population declining for the first time in recorded history. They have internal debt skyrocketing. You know, there won't be a Japan in 50 years, maybe not even in 30 years. One has to know that. But in the meantime, uh, I have investments in Japan because those catastrophic events are still a, a good ways away and most people are not paying too much attention. It does give you a the insight that maybe you should invest in old age homes or ways to take care of an aging population. But it has not changed my view on investing in Japan. But normally, if you find a country with a young workforce and, and emerging, it's usually better to have a lot of young people educated if possible, because you usually find better opportunities. And they're usually cheaper. The countries are usually cheaper if they're just emerging from poverty with no education and no people. Gotcha. And 
I I believe you've said recently that we're about to experience a a large bear market. Is there anything that people Americans or or people around the globe would want to think about in order to prepare themselves for such a an well, event? That's not- not quite what I said. What I said was, is we have, we have always had bear markets throughout history, uh, and we will have them again. Just a quick uh, interjection. The former head of the central bank in America, her name was Janet Yellen, says, no, we're not going to have any more bear markets. We have things under control. So if you believe Mrs. Yellen, you should not listen to me at all. But my view is we've had bear market since the beginning of time all over the world, and we will again. And what I said was, when we have the next one, (coughs) it's going to be horrible, the worst in my lifetime. And that is, I'm I'm surprised anybody thinks that's of any interest because it seems so obvious to me, but we had a big bear market in 2008 because of huge debt problems around the world. Well, since then, Derek, the debt everywhere has gone through the roof. I mean, staggering amounts of debt, even in China now. I mean, China had very little debt in 2008, but everywhere has debt now. So all I said was the next time we have one, it's going to be the worst in my lifetime because the debt situation is so, so much worse, staggering worse since 2008. That seems to be a very logical thing. Easy things just to see and say. Some people are always surprised and say, huh, what are you talking about? That's all I'm talking about. The next one's going to be bad. Gotcha. Unless we never have one, as Janet Yellen says, we're not going to have any more bear markets. Hmm. Well, that, uh, <laughs> I guess we'll see. We'll see what happens. <laughs> My uh, friend who recommended to read your books initially is a cryptocurrency expert and investor he comes from a from a banking background i'd love to just get your thoughts i i don't believe you've invested in any cryptocurrencies would you ever and and what do you think of their okay first of all would you invest in cryptocurrencies uh i have never invested in a cryptocurrency Uh, i would and i'm going to make a distinction here between the blockchain and cryptocurrencies because they do at least cryptocurrencies go hand in hand with the blockchain. Uh, the blockchain is going to change everything we know, just as the internet did. In fact, it's partly because of the internet. So there are gigantic taking, things taking place with the blockchain. Uh, having said, and I have not found a way to invest in the blockchain. Having said that, I have never invested in a cryptocurrency, partly because uh, the it's, it, it's got the appearances of bubbles. You know, there are several thousand of them now, and there were none nine years ago. It does not mean they can't be successful. You know, the Internet developed lots of companies in a few years and became changed our lives. Uh, but most of the cryptocurrencies, as far as I can see, don't have, well, let's put it this way. If and when governments decide they don't like cryptocurrencies, they're going to put them out of business, whether we like it or not. And the governments don't like losing control. Governments like to have as much control as possible. The Internet is certainly changing money as we know it. In some countries already, Derek, you cannot use money. I don't know if you've been to China recently. The other day I was was trying to buy an ice cream in China. The poor woman couldn't sell me she could sell me ice cream, but all I had was money. But she couldn't take money. You know, I had to put my phone on her spot in order to pay for it. Well, I didn't have the phone spot, so I couldn't put my spot on her on her money spot. So I couldn't buy, and she couldn't sell because all I had was money. Finally, in the end, she felt sorry for this poor barter and gave me the ice cream. <laughs> I wish I'd been buying a Mercedes or something, you know. She just gave me the ice. But, but my point is the Internet is already changing everything we know as far as money is concerned. Governments love that. First of all, money is expensive. You have to print it, handle it, move it, transport it, replace it, etc. 
for governments. It's a pain for governments, money is. But more important, if they don't have to deal with money, or if you and I don't have money, they have much, much more control. Uh, you know, if all money's on the Internet, whether you call it the box or whatever you call it, if all money's on the Internet, you know, they'll call you up and say, Derek, you've had too much coffee this month. Stop drinking so much coffee. <laughs> they will know everything about you, and they will try to control everything about you. So, yes, the Internet is, going, is changing money. Uh, but when, if things get, if the governments lose too much control, they will eliminate cryptocurrencies. Now, the cryptocurrency guys say, and they're right, we are smarter than the government. And they are, I promise you. Even the dumbest cryptocurrency guy is smarter than the smartest government person. There's no question about that. But, Derek, the governments have the money and the guns. And if they can't want to change things, they have the guns. In the 1930s, during the Depression, well, let's go back. Before the, the 1930s, all over the world, people used whatever they wanted as money. Seashells, gold coins, you know, anything they wanted. Every bank could print its own money if they wanted to. You could print pounds sterling or U.S. dollars in your bank, and people would accept them as money. Anything you wanted to use as money, you could. But And that was so embedded in people's psyche and the way people had done business for centuries. The English government, the British government, made it a capital, an act of treason, an act of treason to use anything except Bank of England banknotes. Now, an act of treason, as you know, means they execute you if you don't do it. So... But it was they had to do something that radical in order to make people change. Well, as I say, Derek, they've got the guns. Hmm. And I don't like it. I don't like it at all. I would like for somebody to come up with a way that we can get around and away from governments. But as long as they have the guns and we don't, I'm afraid cryptocurrencies in the end will not succeed. What may well happen in the end is the governments will come up with their own cryptocurrencies as it just gives them even more control. Instead of letting us use cryptocurrencies that we come up with, if we don't use theirs, it will be an act of treason. Or they just close down the internet. I mean, they can close down the internet. It, of course, it disrupts things dramatically, but it puts all the cryptocurrencies out of business. Then they come back on with the internet and they have even stronger controls. Again, I don't like any of this. Hmm. Don't like it at all. I, would, I, I hope the cryptocurrency guy has around all this, but so far I don't see it. But if you can find your way to invest in the blockchain, I'm very, very keen. Okay. Okay. Great. I will. Oh, pass that along to <laughs> the the people that want to know. Well, um, now, by the way, let me just say, say again, there there are a lot of these things around right now, and a lot of people are buying and selling them, and the good traders are making a lot of money. I don't know how long that will last. The the scenario I just outlined to you isn't necessarily going to happen in June. You know, some of these things may be traded for a while longer, and if you know what you're doing you might be able to make a lot of money. But ultimately, the scenario I gave you is what I'm afraid is going to happen. Mm. And unless I can find something that's going to survive it all, I have not invested. You, you know about computers. You've heard of IBM. I'm sure you've heard of IBM, sure. the largest computer company in the world. Well, Derek, IBM did not invent computers. You never heard of the company which invented computers. You never heard of dozens of scores of companies that were around in the computer business a long time ago. Uh, so just because X cryptocurrency is out there or even was the first or second does not mean it's going to be the, the top dog in the end. Just as the people who invented computers, you never even heard of. And, and so to... Um, we were talking earlier about the, the sources, um, you know, the internet or the BBC to form this opinion. Obviously you have, you know, your, 
your lifelong background of investing and knowledge of geopolitics and all of these things to form this opinion? How, how did you sort of arrive here? Well, it's like everything else. <laughs> Lots of information goes into my brain that stirs around and something comes out. I hope that every once in a while I get it right when something comes out. But it's the more sources of information, the better. I said earlier, I'm trying to teach my daughters to get many sources of information because they all have a bias, they all have a view, and you have to sort out in your own brain what the actual reality is. And I have yet to find a single source of reality. If you know a single source of reality, please don't, <laughs> please don't blurt it out on this, on this interview. Please send me an email later. It's just private email. <laughs> but, but I have not found that single source of information. But I have learned the more sources of information you have. And no matter how it's heard. I mean, I used to read Pravda in the old days, which is the old Russian communist newspaper. You know, mm. read the, you know, especially the crazy ones, are the ones that are off the wall, because then you know what the other, the radical approach is, and sometimes the crazies come out correct. But you have to read them all. You know, I'm sometimes interviewed by people say, how could you... How could you talk to that newspaper? And I would say, how could you not talk to that newspaper? I want them to know, A, my views. There are different views. And B, that's the only way you might change them. And if nothing else, you figure out what they're saying. Because we all need to know it. One of the problems in 2018 is people just won't talk to other people. Which is, which is madness. The U.S. is having serious problems because... Lots of people just won't talk to the other people. So in in studying, you know, how how people socialize and, and social networks and things like that, like we we often are surrounded by people that are pretty similar to us uh, in our neighborhoods or in our work or social groups or whatever. Do you have a practice of, you know, seeking out people that are older or younger or demographically different in order to talk to different people? Well, to repeat, I, I always try to find other sources of information, uh, no matter how, in fact, the more radical or the more absurd, the better, because sometimes, if nothing else, that shows you the direction where things are going, and sometimes it helps you formulate with what, what is actually what the real reality is going to be. Uh, I don't have a specific way to do that. When I go to a new town, I always try to go to the dangerous part of town, but just to see it and to experience it, because I've learned so many times that the dangerous part of town is not dangerous at all, just what people think it is. Like I used to was terrified of red China in 1984. Uh, so I've been to many dangerous parts of town, but it doesn't, it rarely brings me a new investment insight, but the main insight is the dangerous part of town is not very dangerous. It's just dangerous in people's minds. Gotcha. And I, I believe you have said that you're interested in investing in North Korea, but aren't allowed to. Um, that's that's some place that a lot of people consider like a dangerous neighborhood. What? What makes you want to invest there? Well, first of all, I, I've been to North Korea a couple of times. Of course, Americans aren't allowed to now. But I will tell you, North Korea is one of the least dangerous places in the whole world. I mean, if you do something foolish, of course it's dangerous. You know, there was an American college kid recently who tried to steal posters off the wall, and he wound up getting arrested. If you did that, and if you were North Korean and you went to America and tried to tear posters off the wall, probably get arrested too. In fact, I know you would get arrested. Uh, so it is a place where there is, first of all, it's hated, it's cheap, uh, and there are dramatic changes taking place. It's where China was in 1981 or 82, you know, dramatic changes taking place, very cheap, many opportunities. I don't know any ways to invest because I'm an American, 
But if you are not an American, there are huge numbers of ways to invest. You know, they don't have anything. They don't have tablecloths. They don't have chairs. They don't have anything. They're just now getting the Internet, just now getting mobile phones. It's all new and huge opportunities. You seem so unique, I mean, among people in general, to to conceptualize even taking long adventure trips like that to have success in investing. What is it about you that has allowed you to be such a successful investor and adventurer and survive well, your trips? <laughs> well, I am alive. That's, I'm delighted to say that. Uh, but I always wanted to see. I grew up in a very small village in the backwoods of Alabama, you know, and I guess if you, most people who grow up in places like that never leave or never want to do much. The uh, place where I grew up, yeah, my, my phone number was five, just to show you how, how far in the backwoods it was. Uh, and I'm the one of those who got the madness that I wanted to see it all and experience it all. And even when I was young, I, I remember once saying to my, when I was 16, saying to my girlfriend in this little town, you know, I'm 16 years old and I've never been anywhere. And she said, what? I'm 16. I've been to Birmingham. I've been to Montgomery. I've been to Mobile. I mean, she'd been everywhere in the world as far as she was concerned. <laughs> she didn't quite understand what I was talking about. Um, so I've had this madness for a long time to see it all, experience it all. And uh, once I had a little bit of money saved up, I set out to do it. Then I was... I. I tried to avoid getting killed, but I did want to experience as much as I could. And likewise with investing, I learned very early, and I guess that's helped me in my adventures, I learned very early that if you listen to the conventional wisdom, you're probably not going to make, you're probably going to lose money. That you need to understand that the market and the, the conventional wisdom is nearly always wrong, so it's hard to try to figure out what the real reality is and invest accordingly. Brilliant. Uh, so, so I have one final question. And if you could, if you could change or add something to the world, what would you want the world to have? Well, uh, <laughs> there are lots of answers to that, needless to say, but I guess the simple place to start would be Let's eliminate passports and eliminate visas. I'm sure you've crossed many borders. You know, just unbelievable amounts of time, energy, money are spent making a border crossing. Millions of people are employed doing nothing but checking passports and immigration, etc. Just, it's just the amount of money that, that the world spends on just border crossing is incomprehensible. It does very little good. For most of the past 5,000, 10,000 years, whatever you have for you want to go back, there was no such thing as a passport. Passports were really only introduced mainly by the British as a way to control their citizens 100 years ago. You know, all those people who immigrated to America didn't have passports, didn't have visas. Uh, they probably couldn't have gotten visas if they wanted to get a visa for the U.S. And thank goodness, of course, you know, that's what made America, one of the things that made America so successful. Uh, and when you have people who pack up and leave and go to a new country, they're usually the bright ones, the ones with initiative, courage, etc. And that's what helped make America great and many other countries throughout history. So I guess the simple thing to start with would be eliminate passports, eliminate visas. That would save the world staggering amounts of money staggering amounts of energy and we would all be better off i'm sure you're going to say or somebody's going to say oh my god we got to have passports well most of history we've had no passports anywhere in the world including 100 years ago in america all those people came to america who didn't have passports didn't have visas every american listening to this their forebears maybe three four year generations ago didn't have a passport and yet somehow they got to America and changed their lives and changed America. But I could go on and on. There many things have changed. That's just, <laughs> we're talking about adventure and travel and the world. 
let's start there. I think a lot of people would really enjoy <laughs> enjoy that freedom. So, Jim, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a, it's been a real pleasure. My pleasure, Derek. Good luck. Let's do it again sometime. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Brilliant episode with Jim Rogers. Hope you guys learned something, got to enjoy some of his tales of adventure. Uh, I really enjoyed, since I recorded this interview, so uh, a couple weeks ago, I have been really digging into how Jim Rogers thinks, and it's so fascinating to see how these great investors approach investing. And it's actually very simple, just about seeing the opportunities from a human level, as, as Jim says it, from the ground up. And it really makes it seem accessible. So hopefully this interview did a little bit of that for you today. And uh, definitely check out his books, Investment Biker and Adventure Capitalist, if you haven't. They, they sold a ton of copies. I, uh, several hundred thousand is, is my understanding. So I've got a little bit of catching up to do. And that's where you guys can help. You can pre-order your copy of Superconductors, which is out July 3rd. That is the book that I wrote over the last several years doing research based on this podcast and all of the countries that I have been traveling around to. So Superconductors is my my version of Adventure Capitalist. Um, would love for you to check it, out, check it out. It's it's really awesome. I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and say that. I just reread it. It's really amazing. <laughs> so Superconductors, that's published by Kogan Page. You can buy it there or anywhere else that you get books. That's all for today's episode. Now it's your turn to go out there and be adventurous. (laughs) 